Imagine for a moment traveling back 60 million years to an era when colossal creatures ruled the earth. Now think of the biggest snake you've ever seen. You're probably thinking of the Titanoboa, and as enormous as it may seem, it wouldn't come close to the Titan we're going to talk about today. This prehistoric reptile with unimaginable proportions has been considered one of the most impressive predators of its time. But while encountering this snake would have been absolutely terrifying, surprisingly, it might not have been the most fearsome snake in history. Want to know why? Stay tuned and find out. It's often overlooked that the Titanoboa, despite its imposing size, wasn't a ravenous machine that devoured mammals and crocodiles every day. In reality, it was an apex predator specialized in a very different diet, fish. This theory was first proposed when skull bones were found showing adaptations for an aquatic lifestyle, including an extremely high number of teeth that weren't as durable as those of other boas, and a palate similar to that of snakes that hunt fish today. This discovery was further supported by the Titanoboa's habitat in Paleocene Colombia, a tropical environment covered by extensive rivers where it likely spent most of its life. It's believed that Titanoboa primarily fed on fish like lungfish and osteoglossomorphs, so it seems the Titanoboa wasn't as terrifying as we thought. Unless, of course, you're a fish, but... But hold on, because there's a family of prehistoric snakes that could easily compete with Titanoboa for the title of the scariest snake on Earth. These members not only had more voracious and exotic diets, but also much more chilling ways of eliminating their prey. Additionally, recent studies suggest that this relatively unknown group of snakes grew even larger than the Titanoboa. We're talking about the Madsoidae. Currently, 17 species of these snakes are known, and their origins trace back even earlier than the ancestors of the Titanoboa, with the first Madsoidae evolving about 98 million years ago during the Cretaceous period. Interestingly, very little is known about this first member, as its discovery was limited to a single bone. In fact, to this day, this member remains formally unidentified, and one of the few things we know about it is that it comes from Sudan, suggesting that this family first appeared in Africa. What's even more fascinating is that, whatever this snake was, it didn't waste any time establishing itself. By the end of the Cretaceous, the Madsoide had already significantly expanded its range, with multiple species present in Europe, Asia, and Australia. These members varied not only in their geographical distribution, but also in size. Some species, like Alus, were small, reaching only 2.6 feet or 0.8 meters, while others, like Sona, could grow to over 11 feet or 3.5 meters, a size comparable to a large king snake. While these early Madsoidae reached a respectable size, they still weren't the dominant predators in their ecosystems. They lived in the shadow of dinosaurs, and it's believed that, to survive, these snakes adopted opportunistic diets, feeding on anything they could catch, including dinosaurs themselves. Though they hadn't yet reached their full potential by that time, they were already using a feature that arguably made them more brutal than Titanoboa, their jaws. Are you enjoying what you're watching? If so, consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps me keep creating content like this for you. It costs you nothing, and it motivates me a lot to keep making more videos. So if you want to support the channel, go ahead and subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell so you don't miss anything. Now, let's get back to the video. Like Titanoboa and other boas, Matsoidae were constrictors that used powerful muscles to strangle their prey. However, what set them apart was their primitive skull structure, less flexible and narrower than that of modern boas. This led paleontologists to suggest that these ancient snakes couldn't swallow their prey whole. Why is this important? You might think this is good news, since if they couldn't swallow something whole, it probably wasn't on their menu, right? Well, not exactly. Although they couldn't swallow overly large prey, they could still capture it thanks to their powerful, constricting muscles. For prey too large to swallow whole, they would simply use their teeth and jaws to tear it into more manageable pieces, possibly twisting and turning like eels, resulting in literally shredded chunks of flesh. In other words, this isn't a fate you'd want to face. Unfortunately, for many prey animals, this terrifying fate became harder to escape as the Cretaceous period progressed. As the Matsoidae snake family continued to evolve, they grew larger with each new genus. This impressive growth reached its peak in the late Cretaceous with Madsoia, the snake that gave the family its name. This colossal serpent inhabited both India and Madagascar during the last days of the Cretaceous, 
reaching sizes that rival those of today's largest snakes. In India, mad soya specimens are estimated to have grown up to about 5 meters, comparable to the longest known boa constrictors today. But on the island of Madagascar, mad soya could reach even larger sizes, growing up to 8 meters, putting it in the same range as the reticulated pythons, the longest snakes known today. In Madagascar's Cretaceous habitat, it's believed that nearly any dinosaur or animal nearby could have been fair game for these giants, at least when they were adults. During their youth, however, their diet was likely more restricted, but Mad Soya had another trick that made it an even greater threat than the dinosaurs it coexisted with, its incredible durability. In fact, Mad Soya is one of the few animals that actually survived the KT extinction event, Cretaceous Tertiary. While we know that some groups of animals persisted, it's extremely rare to find a single genus that can be traced across the transition from the Mesozoic to the Cenozoic. Remarkably, an adult mad soya would have weighed around 75 kilograms, over three times the typical weight of other KT extinction survivors. Its survival is attributed to its low profile, its ability to hide in hard-to-reach areas, and its extremely slow metabolism, allowing it to go up to a year without eating. With a world now free of non-avian dinosaurs, Mad Soya faced no obstacles in leading its family of snakes to new heights. By the time the Eocene arrived, 10 million years after the end of the Cretaceous, this snake had managed to spread to South America, and its size had drastically increased. Specimens in Argentina measured up to 10 meters, making them the longest predators known at the time. With this increase in size, many paleontologists believe that Mad Soya became an apex predator, feeding on a wide range of animals including crocodiles, mammals, horses, and primates. Despite being one of the largest known, Mad Soya was not the largest snake to emerge from this family. It's thought to have been the direct ancestor of one that would be. During the late Cretaceous, Mad Soya in India survived in a manner similar to its counterpart in Madagascar, establishing dominance in India, which was then a completely isolated island, shielding it from potential new competitors. This isolation, along with the fact that the Earth was much warmer after the Mesozoic, allowed these snakes to grow even larger. This trend toward gigantism peaked about 47 million years ago during the Middle Miocene, when Mad Soya or one of its descendants evolved into what may have been the largest snake of all time, Vukis indicus. Although fossils of the snake were discovered in 2005, it took a year to describe it due to the initial confusion among paleontologists who thought it was a large crocodile. Only after reviewing the fossils did they realize it was a snake. Recent estimates suggest that the Vuki has reached between 12.2 meters and 15.2 meters. At the upper end of this range, the Vukis would dethrone the Titanoboa from its 15-year reign as the longest snake known to science. Additionally, the Vukas was incredibly heavy for a snake, weighing close to a ton comparable to that of an adult giraffe. Without a doubt, encountering this creature would have triggered intense primal fears. Unfortunately for those with ophidiophobia, the fear of snakes encountering the Vukis would have been much easier than meeting the Titanoboa. Unlike the latter, the Vukis is believed to have been a mostly terrestrial creature that moved through dense swamps, where it could easily ambush unsuspecting prey. Then it would trap them with its powerful constricting muscles and tear them apart with its sharp teeth. Area analyses suggest a varied and impressive diet, with prey that included different types of crocodiles, turtles, and even a primitive whale species. In its environment, the Vukis was the largest predator in both length and weight, making it the undisputed apex predator. It maintained this status for millions of years, although, fortunately for its prey, the Vukis did not last forever. It seems to have gone extinct at the end of the Eocene, likely due to global cooling, which made its enormous size unsustainable given its ectothermic nature, cold-blooded. Although the end of the Vukis marked the end of an era for giant snakes, it did not signify the complete extinction of the Mad Soidae family. In fact, these snakes continued to be quite successful in various parts of the world. However, there was one place in particular that became a hotbed for the Mad Soidae, Australia. This should come as no surprise given the continent's extreme climate, which is practically a land full of creatures that challenge the imagination. If you want to learn more about this, I recommend checking out our video on prehistoric Australia. Now let's leave reality behind for a moment and return to the Titanoboa scenario, imagining a fictional world where it didn't go extinct. What would have happened? 
The Titan Oboa, being cold-blooded, depended on the surrounding heat to survive. Unlike warm-blooded animals, which can regulate their internal temperature, cold-blooded animals need external warmth to heat up and accelerate their metabolism. This made a warm planet the perfect paradise for the Titan Oboa. However, the Titan Oboa eventually went extinct. Why? Earth underwent significant climate changes. First it became even hotter, then came a drastic cooling. 56 million years ago, Earth experienced a sudden warming. This phenomenon is known as the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. During this period, vast amounts of carbon dioxide were released into the atmosphere, raising temperatures by up to 8 degrees Celsius. The seas warmed so much that in the tropics, the water temperature reached about 38 degrees Celsius, like a hot bath. This led to a mass extinction of creatures in the deep ocean, especially unicellular organisms known as foraminifera. So, what happened to the Titanoboa? There could have been two possible outcomes. One option is that this giant snake might have thrived in warm waters and grown even larger, even if some fish were dying off. Other reptiles, like turtles and crocodiles, might also have increased in size thanks to the heat, providing a great food source for the Titanoboa. In this scenario, our Titanoboa could have become even bigger and more terrifying during this period of extreme heat. But there's another possibility. Perhaps the Titanoboa went extinct due to the high temperatures. The rapid heat increase caused the oceans, which absorb carbon dioxide, to become more acidic. This could have led to the death of many fish in those warm, acidic waters, leaving the Titanoboa with fewer prey to feed on. If this was the case, the Titanoboa would have had to adapt to survive. What evolutionary change would have helped it survive this warming? Well, if the tropical waters were too hot and acidic to live in, the most logical move for the Titanoboa would have been to migrate to land. This would mean shifting from a diet primarily based on fish to a carnivorous one, hunting other animals on land. As the earth warmed, something interesting was happening on the surface. On land, mammals were proliferating and diversifying. Camels, horses, pigs, goats, and giraffes evolved during this time when the earth was like a giant greenhouse. So, if the Titanoboa had moved to land, it would have found new food sources to survive. However, due to its enormous size, living on land would not have been easy. Therefore, the Titanoboa would have needed another type of adaptation to overcome this extreme heat period. It is likely that it would have developed more powerful swimming muscles and headed toward the poles. Back then, the poles were no longer covered in ice but had become tropical. The ice melted, and the polar seas were filled with crocodiles, which would have been the perfect feast for a hungry Titanoboa. After 200,000 years, this period of extreme heat would have finally ended and temperatures would have returned to normal. But another major climatic change was about to come. Cooling. Around 50 million years ago, temperatures began to slowly drop in a cooling trend that lasted until the beginnings of civilization. The lush forests that once covered the poles started to transform into ice sheets. This was not good for the Titanoboa. The colder climate did not suit this cold-blooded snake, as it could not obtain the heat it needed from the environment to stay active. It is likely that this cooling period was what caused its extinction around 55 million years ago. For it to have survived, the Titanoboa would have had to evolve in a completely different and surprising way. In this hypothetical scenario, the Titanoboa becomes a warm-blooded animal. You may be wondering, how could a cold-blooded creature become warm-blooded? Is that even possible? Although there are no examples of warm-blooded snakes, there are exceptions in cold-blooded animals. For example, some fish. Although the vast majority of fish are cold-blooded, a small percentage, around 0.1%, are either fully or partially warm-blooded. The sunfish is an example of a warm-blooded fish. Others, like the bluefin tuna, white sharks, and salmon, have a mix of both systems. These fish use a special mechanism called counter-current heat exchange to raise their body temperature. Let me explain how this works. Let's take a shark as an example. The muscles it uses to swim generate heat, warming the blood in the veins. The arteries, on the other hand, carry cold, oxygenated blood from the gills to the muscles and organs of the shark. That cold blood picks up heat from the blood in the veins, which raises the shark's internal temperature. In the case of the Titanoboa, it doesn't have gills since it breathes through its nostrils and gets oxygen through its lungs. But in this scenario, we could make the Titanoboa work like a shark. Its cold blood would be pumped through the arteries, picking up heat from the warm blood in the veins. 
this evolutionary transformation would have allowed the Titan of Boa to survive the major climatic cooling. Now, let's see what would have happened next. During the Miocene, the Earth warmed up slightly, followed by another cooling period. The climate became drier and the vegetation tougher. In North America, rhinoceroses dominated. Many species of horses arose, as well as a great variety of camels. There was also a saber-toothed cat-like creature called Nimravidae roaming around. Could the Titan Oboa have evolved differently to adapt to the desert? Although I said living on land would be complicated for such a large creature, perhaps there is an evolutionary path that could make it possible. To camouflage itself in the desert, it would have had to change its color to a lighter, sandy tone. Additionally, it would need a key adaptation. Strong muscles for digging in the sand and living underground during the day, conserving energy, and hunting at night. To avoid water loss through its skin, the Titan Oboa could take inspiration from the burrowing toad, which secretes a semi-permeable membrane that makes its skin thicker and retains moisture. This desert Titan Oboa would have a different diet based on birds and mammals. Since many desert animals are small, it would wait for a herd of camels to pass by, then slither out of its burrow and attack. This could lead to the evolution of two subspecies of Titanoboas. The first, similar to sharks, would swim through the oceans and maintain its body heat thanks to warm-blooded adaptations. The second, also warm-blooded, would live in desert burrows, like the sandworms from Dune, emerging to the surface only to hunt and then retreating. These 21st century Titan Oboas could grow up to 23 meters long and 1.2 meters wide. Can you imagine swimming in the sea and encountering one of these? You'd hardly have time to take a final breath. This leads us to ask, how would modern humans interact with such impressive and terrifying creatures? Before modern hunting practices, Titan Oboas would have been legendary creatures that would have caused real terror among humans. Our ancestors would have feared entering the sea because any bath could be the last if you encountered a Titano boa. The only good thing is that they probably wouldn't be interested in eating us, as we wouldn't be very nutritious. They'd prefer to hunt large fish or crocodiles. However, as humans develop better weapons, the relationship would have changed. There is evidence that humans hunted whales as far back as 8,000 years ago. If the Titan Oboa still existed, it's possible that it would have been targeted by fishermen thousands of years ago and even could have become part of our diet. If its meat was tasty, humans might have hunted them to near extinction. Today, it would be something similar to occasional shark attacks. We'd occasionally hear about Titan Oboa attacks on people venturing too far into the ocean. In the desert, nomadic tribes would probably fear the unexpected attacks from the desert Titan Oboa. Camels would have evolved to detect underground movements, alerting humans when they sensed activity beneath the earth. With infrared technology, we could detect the thermal signature of Titan Oboas in their underground burrows. But today, something new and surprising would be happening. Human activity has reversed the planet's cooling trend. With global warming, temperatures are becoming attractive again for reptiles. The Titan Oboas, which developed warm blood to survive past cooling periods, would once again rely on external heat rather than internal mechanisms. The warmer climate would allow them to hunt more efficiently and grow even larger. With the rising sea levels in the coming years, our coastal cities will be flooded and destroyed, and the warm climate will favor new generations of Titanoboas. However, the Titanoboas' traditional habitats are being destroyed. Tropical rainforests and the swamps near tropical waters are disappearing due to deforestation and commercial activity. Furthermore, the growing acidification of the oceans will kill the marine life that the Titanoboa depends on. Now let's leave this hypothetical scenario behind and return to reality. We won't see giant Titanoboas lurking on our coasts or deserts. However, what remains is the lesson that the history of the Titanoboa teaches us. The fragility of ecosystems and how drastic climate changes can lead to the extinction of dominant species.